Okay, three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the newest edition of Security on the N30, whatever network that you want to call us. We have Tom here, and he read something that got him all hot and bothered. Is that right? Yes, very much so. So what can get you so possibly hot and bothered other than, other than the, the screenshot I sent you about 10 minutes ago? Oh, man. Um, and we, we will discuss that, too. Uh, the Really... There, there are two things in security that get me all hot and bothered. One, really, like, onerous security policy that people try to force down other people's throats, and the only thing it does is make people less secure. Like, you know, changing your password every 60 hours. Or, um, you know, banks that require a 900-character password. Or require you to use four really common, really dumb security questions. Um, just, you know, bad policy in general that leads to really bad security. But the other side of this is when a company or person or security professional has legitimate concerns about something that's happening in technology, but they blow it out of proportion and they make it seem like it's the end of the world. Uh, we call this FUD, Fear, Uncertainty, and Doubt. And they're just spreading FUD, saying, ah, the sky is falling and... Throw away your mobile phones, light your computers on fire, take your smart televisions and throw them out the window. <sighs> People, they, we don't need the panic. And really, this happens a lot because these guys want to get on TV, they want to get noticed, they want to you know, turn heads and, and really just get people to watch them and talk to them and interview them and get more business sent to their company. And it's just horrible. Well, let me tell you a funny story about TVs and smart-enabled TVs. So our school just installed a whole bunch of, I, whatever, L, I think they're LG flat screens all over the cafeteria with an IR blaster. Guess what the HTC M8 has in it? An IR blaster. <laughs> so, nice. And apparently some of them had Chromecasts. That was a rumor, like hooked up into them randomly. So the kids were, <laughs> were changing the channels and and uh, putting ESPN or whatever on. Or <laughs> up, the rumor of the Chromecast is just purely speculative. But so there is there is this security notion that we have to be careful. But it was a simple piece of masking tape, uh, black duct tape, putting over over the IR sensor, and you're done. Yeah. No need to get all crazy except for the administrator in charge who's now had to run around uh, with his head cut off. <laughs> I, I love the, the really simple solutions to security like that. I absolutely love it. You know, you can, you can buy the really expensive enterprise TVs with the serial port and the Ethernet jack and network them and set group policy for your television. Or you can get some duct tape. There you go. And most of the time, it's duct tape versus everything else. Yeah. Well, it fixes everything. I mean, that's that's really how I keep my machine virus free. So uh, good old duct tape fixes everything. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's always, and we just we just said, it's the, the obvious security fix. And usually, what is it, Occam's Razor that says the simplest solution is usually the best one? So... Yeah, so what's this FUD that you're reading? So this, I actually, I, I was, this was, was brought to my attention. Um, a, a person in my company decided to forward an email and say, oh my God, is this something we should be worried about? What are we doing to protect ourselves against this? And sent a link to a YouTube video um, to my boss. And my boss... Um, turns and emails me and says, you know, hey, uh, me and another guy that, you know, we do phones, he knows I'm on the security side, he says, hey, you know, what is this, should we be worried? And I'm not going to say the name of the company, I'm not going to say the name of the interview, the station, the guy doing this, because frankly, he doesn't need any more publicity, he's gotten enough right now. Um, and, you know, bad-mouthing security professionals on air probably doesn't get you very far in the industry. Uh, but his company has put together a list, and granted, it's a good list. It's got permissions on one side, and it's got the names of apps at the top, and says, guys, look at this. These are the permissions 
um, that certain flashlight apps are accessing on your phone. And if you think about it, a flashlight app really doesn't need much, if any, permissions, right? It just needs to be able to turn on the phone's, you know, the, the flash for the camera. Um, and with that, in some models of Android, you actually need the camera permission. So, you know, the allow this app to take photos and videos because that's bundled in with the camera flash. Um, so it sounds scary at the start, but, you know, that's the very minimum that you need to run the app. Um, some applications will ask for more permissions. So, internet access. Well, why does a flashlight need internet access? Well, if a company wants to track stats or usage or bug reports or crash dump logs or what if they want to show ads and, you know, give you a free flashlight, but you see ads when you're using the flashlight and they make some money on the side, everyone wins, right? They need the network permission for that. So, it sounds scary when you think, oh, my flashlight it has full access to the internet and to stuff on my phone, and it can take pictures. What is it doing? This company took that and took it to the next level in this interview and said, hey, um, these things are malware. They're Trojans, and if you install an Android flashlight app, it's you know horrible for your phone, and it actually installs malware, and even if you uninstall it, everything's gone, and they're stealing all your data, and they're watching what you're doing, and it made it seem like, you know, the biggest virus since Stuxnet, like the biggest cyber attack since, well, you know, the last big cyber attack. Uh, but the, the fact of the matter is the majority of these apps are asking permissions to do things like, you know, um, keep the device turned on when you're using a flashlight or show you ads or turn on the flash, because it's a flashlight. Uh, really simple things. And there are a couple apps that request a lot of permissions. Stuff that, frankly, they shouldn't have access to. I'm going to initially blame this on lazy development. Because, you know, as we all know, do not attribute to malice what could easily be explained by stupidity. Now, when you're making Android apps, if anyone's made Android apps, messing with permissions is horrible. It's a nasty, horrible thing as a developer. Google has tried to make this as easy as possible, but it's still not great. Some developers say, ah, yeah, uh, I just want to make a simple flashlight. That's all I want to do. I don't want to mess with permissions. I don't know what it needs. I don't know what it's asking for. It just won't let my code run. Just give it all the permissions. All the permissions in the world, you have access to everything. This is actually fairly common in software development to say, okay, we're going to strip away all of the controls we're going to turn off the firewalls, we're going to disable the antivirus, we're going to turn off UAC, we're going to run it as administrator, we're going to give it full permissions and see if it's the code that's wrong or it's something else. Sometimes some developers are either lazy or forgetful, sometimes both, um, and they forget to either retract permissions or turn back on firewalls or, or other things like that. Um, Sometimes they just push out the app and say, hey, uh, just run this as admin because I don't want to be bothered to do it the right way. And Well, look, I'm looking at this website, which, again, I will, will rem remain nameless, and I'm seeing uh, a whole slew, and, and I'm looking at this, and even I'm saying, hey, wait a second. But then I'm starting to read the permissions. So they checkbox all the obvious permissions. Uh, I mean... <laughs> I'm just looking, control flashlight, like you said, modify system settings, and I understand all those. But it, like, but I think what, what would I rather, so I went, to the, I went to the Google Play site, and I'm looking for something that says, this is why we need all these permissions. Yeah. Some, some developers do do that. They say, please, on, uh, for reasons for permissions, please click here or something like that. And the I think best you're developers right. do that. Yeah, and I think, like you said, they made a simple LED. They made a simple flashlight. They're probably charging a dollar for it, and they're trying to just make some money. And I mean, who cares about the security? It turns a flashlight on. Yeah. Now, some of these permissions have been used nefariously in the past. So, if an app asks, hey, if it asks for the permission to create shortcuts on the home screen, which one of these apps do, um, you know, it 
sometimes has been used to add spammy icons. You know, like when you buy a, a computer from a big box store nowadays, you'll get, you know, the eBay icon and the Yahoo icon and the supercoolgames.com icon or whatever because companies are paying advertising space to put icons on the desktop. I mean, they're lowering um, your price. I mean, essentially that's what they're right. doing. So some of these apps that have asked that permission before are not specifically any of the flashlight apps, but some apps in the Play Store have done really spammy things like that. Now, when Google finds out, the developer gets a warning, or they get the smackdown, and their app is gone. Um, it's not really what it's supposed to be used for. It's supposed to be used, you know, if a flashlight app wanted to use this legitimately, you know, they say, okay, uh, you know, back flashlight, or camera flashlight, or they might say just white screen, or red screen, or night mode, or super bright, and they put, like, that set of icons on your home screen. I wouldn't like it. I don't like stuff on my home screen, but, you know... I, if somebody could make the argument that it's value add. Now, you know, this there's, you know, a or more flashlight apps that ask for GPS and not like citywide, like really precise location GPS. Why? I mean, there there could be targeted advertising based on you know your very specific local location. They might be using your GPS and an ad service to give you very targeted ads for your local area that says, hey, you know, you're 100 feet from Walmart. You should probably go buy something. Um, or, you know, something like that. Or it could be taking all your you know, text messages and photos and passwords and usernames and all this stuff and shipping it off to the highest bidder out in, you know, the mob somewhere. But... We don't know that it is, and to start yelling that every flashlight app is out to kill you and your family is the wrong way to do it. There are big security issues in the world. This is not one of them. Saying that this is the end-all, be-all security issue of our day and age, that this is the next thing that's on fire that people should be concerned about, just drastically lowers the importance of every other issue. Shell shock is a big issue. Not necessarily for users. You know, Home Depot, that's a big issue. People are going to be affected by it. It's, They're going to be annoyed by it. The, I mean, the flashlights, I, it's this is the third a show or second show. This is like the second show we've done in like two months, specifically about Android permissions, because it still comes up. And it's just crazy. Easy that somebody puts this article out to get a hundred to get millions of hits on their website and and you just have to look beyond that. Yeah. It, 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 and of course, all the major news outlets eat this up, and they have the people on for interviews, and they say, you know, are our children safe with these smartphones? And this guy says, no, they're full of malware and Trojans, and I mean, come on. Well, so continuing with this, first thing, his recommendations, disable your GPS. And I tell people, no, never disable your GPS, because if you lose your phone, you can use Android's, uh, whatever, their, their uh, device manager to find your phone. Right. I mean, it's. I think it's more important to be able to find your phone because you're more likely to lose it than than somebody sending you targeted ads when you're near a Walmart. Yeah, it's like I don't. And of course, you know, no one has asked these developers. No one has said, "Hey, uh, you know, Super Flashlight Dude," or whatever the app's name. Why do you need GPS? Why do you need? the ability to put icons on my home screen. Why do you want the ability to show notifications? You know, no one has asked these people, and I'm sure for a lot of them, um, one of the flashlight apps I use is on this list. I review permissions before I install an app. And you know what? Here's a general catch-all. Here's a rule of thumb for everyone for all time for all of Android. If you go to install an app, it shows you the list of permissions. If you say, hold on a minute, this flashlight shouldn't need my GPS. That's weird. That could be shady. Don't install it. I mean, I, I realize that people don't read the list of permissions when they go to install an app, but you really should because it's not a lot of text. It's really condensed, really easy to read. It's not legalese. It just says, hey, look, this app, uh, you know, if you're downloading a texting app, it says this app wants to send and receive receive SMS messages. This could cost you money. Yeah, 
it's a text messaging app. That sounds fine. This app also wants, you know, your GPS coordinates. Well, why? That's odd. That should be a red flag. You should not install that app. Or do a little bit of research. See if the developer said, well, we asked for GPS because you can hit a button and it sends your GPS coordinates over text message to your friends. You say, oh, that could be a handy feature, I guess, maybe. That makes sense. It's, I'm looking at this list, and there's a few that have every permission checked, and there are a few that have only the, the ones that I think are absolutely necessary. Install a shortcut. It, well, who doesn't want a widget shortcut to their screen? It's at late at night, and you have to now unlock your phone and then find the app and do this and the other thing. I, of course, want a widget for that, if, especially if I'm using a flashlight app in the dark. But if you look at these, disable GPS, disable NFC, uh, well, everything you're – disable Bluetooth. Well, okay, then why do you have a smartphone if all you have to do every single time is turn all these things on? Bluetooth, you have a headset? Well, now you got to turn it on. NFC, well, now you can't use the newly fangled Apple Pay that uses NFC. GPS, you don't want the phone to be always aware of your location, but when you lose it, you're not going to have it. It's, it's yeah, let's turn off – let's turn the phone off while we're at it. Every time you want to yeah. use a smartphone, turn it back, turn it on. I cannot attribute the what the big you know. There's there's one clear worst case flashlight app, right? There's one in that list that's just horrible and asks for all these permissions. I cannot attribute that to malice. I cannot, in good conscience, say this developer is evil. He wants your traffic. He wants your location. He's taking your data. And he's selling it to the highest bidder. I can't say that. What it looks like to me is someone who's developing their first app, a flashlight, because that's a great first project when you're an Android developer. You know, you look at the App Store and you say, well, everyone's done these things. What's something easy I can tackle myself? A flashlight. This will be great. I'll learn how the hardware works. I'll learn how the software works. I'll learn how to make an interface. And then they run into the permissions wall and they say, well, we'll just allow everything and see what happens. And it's... I, I can't really say that the developer was doing anything wrong. I can say that maybe they were lazy, but, you know, they could be doing something wrong, and if they are, probably shouldn't install it. If you're worried about it, don't install it. Well, and then if, if enough people... See, the problem goes back to nobody cares about security until it's too late. And and you look at Target, you look at Home Depot, you look at all these places, nobody's, nobody's on the hook for any of these credit card things, so they say, you know what? I'm not on the hook. All I got to do is just relink some accounts. Okay, that's fine with me. Oh wait, it cost me fifty dollars, and maybe I'll be a little more careful. So right. far, look, it's installed. It's in the Play Store. The Play Store looks for apps. They scan them, and and yeah, it has some weird permissions. But a simple email to the developer, and you know what? If the developer doesn't respond, then maybe it's abandoned, and you should move on. And frankly, it's a flashlight app. There's probably hundreds you could choose from. You don't have to pick the one that asks for GPS coordinates. Maybe if you don't want one that needs network access, maybe you just want one that doesn't show ads at all. Pay for it. Buy it for a dollar. Go find one that looks good, that's got the permissions you want, and go buy it. I mean, really, there's so much in the Play Store and in the Apple App Store there is so much choice that if you look at the permissions and you say, this could be shady, there is an alternative. I guarantee you there's an alternative for what you're looking for. And Absolutely. I mean, and it's not, uh, and like you said, it's a flashlight up. It's not anything special. Maybe this one is a feature, but then you have to ask yourself, what does it need? So... Yeah, this is not the flashlight apocalypse. This will not burn our houses down, steal our wallets, and kill our families. This is a simple case of, again, you know, a, a company or people misconstruing Android permissions because they don't know how the development process works. And that's fine because most people don't. Or they're making up a worst-case scenario and saying that someone's evil when they either might be lazy or uninformed themselves. There's a lot of developers out there that put out software that may or may not know the implications of what they've done. We see it all the time. We see insecure software launched and released every single day because they want, you know, speaking, I'm a developer. I make software. 
I think about security when I'm putting some when I'm putting something together as much as I can. I know I've made mistakes before. I know I will continue to make mistakes in the future, but that's how we learn. Um, but most developers aren't concerned with security. They're not security guys. They want to build something that works and put it out and be in production, and that's it. That's their software. They're not thinking, ah, oh, should I really check for SQL injection? Well, am I using memory that's going to be ASLR safe? Am I making sure that the data and executable parts of my application are completely separated? Am I zeroing out sensitive information and in memory so you can't dump it through you know, Mimikatz or another memory management tool? No, frankly. <laughs> no one thinks about that except for security geeks. Um, and it's not their job to. Um, it's, it's our job as security people to say, hey, look, this could be a better way of doing this, and it would make you more secure. Um, and most developers are thankful for the opportunity, but it's, I don't think this is malicious. Um, I, mean, I don't think you should install that app, but I don't think this is malicious. I mean, I'm looking one here that has two permissions. Take pictures and videos and other. Prevent device from sleeping. Two permissions. Yeah, that's it. And that's great. You know, and Coincidentally, that's it's called... Kind of the bare minimum. Yeah. Oh, it is. It's, yeah. And it's, and it's compatible with all my devices except my tablet that doesn't have a LED flash. <laughs> and we're good. And, and look, 8,000, it has 7,900 reviews. That's the other thing. Before you start going, don't, if, you're, if you see all these permissions and it has under 100 downloads or 1,000 downloads or some number that you feel safe and the reviews are horrible, maybe you shouldn't download it. Yeah. If you know, if you look at an app, it's got mostly positive reviews. The permissions look good. You know, it's got four or five stars. It's got ten thousand downloads or a hundred thousand downloads. And you're probably pretty well off at that point. But you know, you've got to be your own judge. And you can visit and everything now. You can visit the the website that they have. So look at the website. If see if they have an email. If you have a question, ask them. Most developers are very, very willing to discuss what they've done, especially if, yeah. if they're charging money because they want to obviously get your business. Yeah, and, you know, ask when, when stuff like this comes up, first and foremost, don't panic. And secondly, you know, ask a security guy that you feel comfortable asking. Ask someone you know. You know, email us. If you see, like, a news story or something that's, like, freaking you out or you're concerned about, or even just have a stupid question like, is this guy on drugs or should I really be concerned, email me. I will be happy to respond. Um, we've done it before, and we'll keep doing it for as long as we're doing the show. And that's our goal. We want to show you all these new apps. We want to tell you what to look out for. And we don't want to scare you. Because, look, we can, we can scare you. I mean, We, <laughs> we have the here. ability. I mean, we can tell you that the world's ending. A million other passwords got leaked, shell shock, and heart bleed, and everything else. But we're looking at it from a perspective of, what does the average person need to know? That's not on the nine, uh, the morning news, or not on the late night news, or whatever it is, and and we go from there. And frankly, in the big picture today, yes, there are problems. Yes, there are things that need to be fixed. Yes, there are real security concerns out in the world. But right now, we're doing a lot better than we were last year, let alone ten years ago. We're getting better at security each and every day, and I feel great about that. And I think it's just going to keep getting better. Talking about great security, I just want to bring up what our buddies at YubiKey did. Yes. They finally shipped out their FIDO UTF, Universal Two-Factor Little Dongle, for, with, Gmail, with Google, so they just got paid. So oh, we, yeah. They're just they're raking it in. We're a little, I'm a little annoyed, and I don't want to say annoyed yet, that our old, uh, our old great YubiKeys don't work and we need to buy new ones, but... As with security, you do not want updatable firmware for right. the obvious reason. And so hopefully we can get people on. So hopefully we can talk about, get them back on to talk about what it is because we talked about what it is, but now we actually have a demonstration. We can do something with it. Let's figure out what it can actually do. Yeah. Let's see how these devices work. Now, keep in mind, 
This is a fresh launch. So, as much as I love YubiKey, and as much as I love the Fighter Alliance, don't run out and buy like a hundred of these and give them to everyone you know. This is a very, very, very new, very fresh security product. It's going to need to be in the market for a little bit to get tested and hammered on and get those, those hackers, you know, beating it down and trying to find the holes. And we'll be better off for it. So, wait a little bit before you buy one. Early adopters and security-minded people and stuff like that, if you want to test it, go find it. Go grab it. For $20, um, I, you can get a YubiKey that will enable you to log into Gmail securely and everything else. But for $50, you can get the YubiKey that we have. So it's all about... It's all about figuring out what you need and waiting, and hopefully there'll be reviews soon that says, yes, this is the greatest thing. Or, in our case, do someone like us, do we upgrade when LastPass works? We can use the one digit or the 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 what's it, the Google Authenticator, and see what you need it for. If nobody's going to accept it to use for payment yet, then wait. Right, right. I'll probably be getting one to test it out, look at the code, see how it interacts. Uh, you know, from a, a user-facing perspective. Um, but uh, when, I, when I've got a good grip on the technology, we'll have a show on that. So, I mean, I think we're done. I think it's time to call it a short show. I do want to mm -hmm. say, I should have said this at the top, I finally encrypted my phone. Very good, very and good. How difficult was it? It was... Well, it wasn't that it was a difficult thing. It's I had to go from my pin lock, which my wife and I knows, and I just have it just just to prevent my son or just prevent a random stranger from picking up my phone to having to put a pin in. And and what I'm about to say is a very, very big first world problem. On an iPhone, on an iOS device, a pin is four digits. So as soon as you hit that fourth digit, it automatically Okay, hits OK or Enter or whatever it is. On an Android device, when you say PIN, they don't determine the length for you. So if you put in a four-digit uh, code that you're used to, you have to hit Enter. And that extra keystroke really bugged me. <laughs> and, and I said, you know what? What I first said is, let me try it. I seem to be OK with it. And I even asked Tom, is there more security if I do or is there more obscurity if I do a three-digit PIN code and make the fourth digit, quote unquote, the Enter key? And I'm not there yet, but we'll go from there. <laughs> so I've encrypted. It's really easy. Just point of order. You can't go back. Yeah. But I looked Once at it's it. encrypted, it's encrypted. It's, yeah. But what I looked at, and maybe this is a topic for another show, is uh, all these stuff have cloud storage systems. All your games, a lot of your data is in the cloud. So when you log in, all that data comes right back. Right. So, so, good or bad, if I ended up going back, there was only one mission-critical app for my car that I like to store gas prices on that I need to manually do myself. So, before I backed up, or before I encrypted, I backed all that up, sent it to Google Drive, and if there was a problem, at least I have some data, but everything just seems to work. Yeah, it really it doesn't change the operation of the phone at all unless you're turning the phone off and then back on. Because before it'll even turn on, it has to ask you for that pen. So, I mean, other than that, I, I think it's... And, and we have a, we can do a whole other show on whether it's anti-American to, to encrypt your phone, as the FBI director now said. And I was almost believing him for a second, but you know what? It's... I'm... So... Apple's going to turn on encryption if they haven't already on iOS 8. Android, I think, is doing it with L. And you know what? If it doesn't hurt you in any way, do it. What's the big deal? Like I said, all the cloud stuff is in the cloud. Your docs, your Google Drives are not... It's encrypted necessarily on the phone, but you still have access to it if you get into bad shape. And it's still on you to be careful. And I, I think doing a, a really clickbaity title of... Is encryption un-American, or is encryption communist? Now that that will be an episode. Yes. So with that, I say we end, and we will see everyone next week. See you guys, and uh, be careful of those flashlights. Yes.